Hey guys, welcome to the Behind the Seams podcast. I'm Nunzia Signore, and my guest today is David Kopp, pitching coach with SEC Powerhouse University of Florida. The Gators play in the SEC and are consistent top 10, if not top five, national program. David's a graduate of Clemson with a degree in sports management. While playing there, he powered the Tigers to three NCAA Super Regional appearances, one ACC championship, and one NCAA College World Series appearance. After the 2007 season, David was selected by the St. Louis Cardinals in the second round of the MLB draft. He wrapped up his professional career in 2014 after pitching for eight seasons in the minor leagues. David came to the Gators from Florida Atlantic, where he spent four seasons as the Owls pitching coach and recruiting coordinator. Prior to FAU, David served as the pitching coach and recruiting coordinator at Florida Southern and a short stint at Clemson as well. So today we'd like to welcome to the show, David Cobb. Hey, David, thanks for coming in, coach. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Before we get into it a bit, I know we've talked about you uh, having eight seasons in the minor leagues. For our young audience, can you talk a bit about the feelings going through the days before the draft? What was going through your mind? How you were feeling? Talk a bit about that. Obviously, an exciting time. It's very hard to explain um, kind of how that feels without really going through it, right? It's like my first maybe collegiate or first professional outing, like, you can't replicate it no matter and no matter how many exhibition games you play you got to be in it so it's the same as the draft it you just got to go through it and and somebody once told me that there's only two people truly happy in the draft with the draft it's the first pick and the last pick <laughs> right yeah everybody else like including myself I was fortunate enough I was drafted in the second round I still thought I should have been drafted higher I still thought I should have made more money right so the, the, if there was one piece of advice may, um, for the young crew out there, it I know it's cliche, but it would be just control what you can control, right? And that's your attitude, your motions, and your effort. Um, we, we're fortunate here at Florida. We, we deal with guys year in and year out that are highly recruited. And, you know, our current Friday night guy was um, was going through it last year. And he ended up turning down the money and come back to school. And, you know, his biggest thing was every time I pitched, obviously you can't escape it. There's going to be scouts in the stands. You're going to be evaluated and recruited at a high level. But his one thing that he focused on every single time he pitched was, did I have a hundred percent conviction and let it eat every pitch? And I just evaluated myself on that. Right. And I it took the external results out of it. Right. So that would be my one piece of advice is just do your best to control what you can control. It's like keeping your eye on the prize. I tell people all the time when you're trying to lose body fat, don't worry about what the scale says. Just worry about the process. Just focus on the process and the end result before you know it will be there. It's like a watch pot never boils. Right. Same kind of concept. It's very easier said than done. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but the more that you do it, the more that you better you get at it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. 100%. That's great advice, man. Every coach recruits and scouts differently. How do you go about evaluating prospects? Can you take me through your process? What do you look for? Just what are your big like numbers one, two, and three? Yeah. So the first thing that I look at for me is, is I look over the mound or on the mound. Um, I'm going to see, you know, obviously the, 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 the size, the frame of the player, I'm going to look at, um, you know, the arm action, the arm speed, um, you know, some of the things mechanically that I look at and I say, oh, okay, I can deal with these things or I, you know, maybe I want to pass, right? Um, or are these things that I feel like when they get to campus that I feel like I can make adjustments with? So I'll look out on the mound. The next thing I look at or vice versa, maybe I look at the plate first, but the next thing I'll look at is, is home plate, right? I'm going to look at the stuff. I'm going to look at the fastball. I'm going to look at the breaks on the fastball. I'm going to look at the slider, the curveball, the changeup. What are those pitches doing, right? So I'm going to look at the plate, I'll look out on the mound. Those are two things, right, that I'll match together. And then the third thing I'll look at is the intangibles, right? I'm going to, I'm going to look at how does this, how does this pitcher – act when there's a bad call how does this pitcher respond when a position player makes an error how does this pitcher interact with his teammates on the bench in between innings is he frustrated 
Can he move on? What do his warmups look like? Right. So some of those intangibles, those X factors, I'll pay attention to. So if we were just going back to one, two, three, I'm looking at home plate. I'm looking at the mound and I'm looking at intangibles. Those are the three things I'm looking at. That's an amazing way to look at it, too, because by breaking it down to the mound and the plate and the intangibles, you're basically taking all the factors that we generally look for in an athlete to begin with. They present themselves in those three areas. It's really absolutely. And some might stand out more than others. Right. If some people say, well, you know, I don't have the size and I say, well, be really good over the plate, trying to figure out your stuff. What can you do within your stuff if if, you know, um, you're struggling that day with the results, can you be really good in your intangibles, right? So some can, some of those buckets can make up for the others at times. We're going to talk about that right now because the first thing you said is I'm going to look at the mound and I'm going to look at the size, okay? Yeah. So I want to talk about two things. I pulled up the Gators roster and you got some big boys on your team. The average pitcher is 6'3", 210. And I think it's really, really great that I say this on the air because I need young guys to understand that not all the time, but size does matter. And now we have a, we have a really high level coach here. And when I asked him what he's looking at, he said the mound and he said the size and the frame of the athlete. On the other side of the coin, I was looking at your commits on perfect game. And I noticed that you've got a 2027 left-handed pitcher listed as 5'11", 150 pounds. So mm -hmm. I'm really curious when you are looking at a guy and you say you're looking at size and frame, how do you go about making a projection on this athlete? He's obviously young mm -hmm. and very projectable, but what do you see knowing that you're looking at size and frame and you see a guy that's almost six feet and 150 pounds, where is your head going in the process of thinking that you're going to recruit this guy? Well, it's always good to win the battle when the guys step off the bus, right? And what I mean is when your players step off the bus, do you look at them and say, wow, that's a physical group. That's one of the very high compliments that, that you can get is when scouts or, you know, another coach looks at your players and says, that's a physical group. Right. That's intimidating, um, man. That's, yeah, that's absolutely. There's an intimidation factor there. And no you doubt. can say whatever you want, but that yeah. is an intimidation factor there. You win the war, right? Right. Absolutely. Right off, right off you step off the bus. Um, but, you know, I think if you look, if I think the, correct me if I'm wrong, but MLB average starting pitcher is probably a little bit north of 6'2, right? I think our uh, Friday night guy, Brandon Sprode, who I mentioned earlier, is about 6'3", and our our Saturday guy currently, Hurston Waldrip, is um, 6'2". So um, it could go. We could go many ways with this. Obviously, in the, in the past, previously, a lot of scouts and a lot of programs wanted the tall, um, physical downhill thrower, and nowadays with the analytics coming in in play, we know that smaller pitchers that could ride the ball maybe at the top of the zone have value too. So there is both sides of the coin. Um, you know, like I said, we, we want our guys, if, if they can be um, to be physical, we, we will also create that when they get here, right. Through our strength and conditioning program, you can't escape your DNA, right? Like when you look at mom and dad, um, sometimes you're going to be tapped out accordingly. Right. And, you know, but for us, and you mentioned one of our, one of our commits, um, he's, he's 5'11", he's 150 pounds or 160 pounds. He is a young guy. So we're hoping that the physicality comes, comes with it. But the one thing with him is he's uber athletic, super elastic, clean, yeah, super clean delivery, um, very hyper mobile. Um, and he throws a bunch of strikes, right? So when you look at that and you say, Hey, this guy's super athletic. The arm speed is, is, is good. He throws a bunch of strikes. He's going to continue to get stronger through his development in high school. And then oh. once he gets here, we can get him stronger as well. And hopefully all those things match up. Because a guy like that, who has all of that in, in his favor. Um, the one thing you have to worry about with a guy like that is that he's going to break. Yeah. yeah. And you have to make sure that he gets strong strong and once i'm sure once you guys get a hold of him like if he's not already 
he's 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 getting there. Pitching, I was interviewing Graham Lehman last week, and mm -hmm. he said, you know, pitching such so wild. You can have a guy like Walker Bueller who throws 98 miles an hour, and then you can have a guy like Marcus Stroman, and you mm -hmm. can have these guys who have like a foot of height and mm -hmm. a, like 90 pounds difference throwing the same velocity. Oh, yeah. Right, it's the only sport where the same position can vary so much in height and weight and excel at, at an elite level, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. getting these younger guys who may be more elastic, they can actually produce force for a longer period of time. They might not be able to produce as much force, but mm -hmm. they can produce it. They can, they're, they're generally, like you said, they're a little more hypermobile. Mm -hmm. they, they, they can actually stay in layback longer. They mm -hmm. have longer lever arms. And these guys are, you know, they can actually use their elasticity to the benefit. Their issue is a lot of times when I notice with guys in here is once their velocity starts ticking over 92, 93 miles an hour, they have to really start to be able to brace themselves better For and sure. have and have that have that muscle that that helps uh, disperse that stress, you know, when they Absolutely. land. So, who do you look to in your organization when? So we're looking at this guy, and you're, you're like, "Wow, this I don't know. I got a feeling about this guy." Who do you look to in your organization when you want a second opinion about a pitcher? Mm -hmm. Well, it's done collectively for us, I think. When either if a guy comes here to camp, it'll be the entire staff, right? Or if we're on the road and one person goes and sees him, there's a possibility or a good chance we're going to have another coach go check him as well. So it'll be multiple eyes. So that way, if one person is a little bit unsure of, hey, which direction we should go, that we're going to have another person to kind of put their opinion um, you know, thankfully we have coach Shelley here who's recruited just a, um, just a couple players over his time, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Um, and he's been doing it for a while and he's seen a lot of players. So we always have his memory bank to, you know, and his expertise to go back on. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about data. What are your thoughts on using data? I asked this to every pitching coach. I get multiple answers. I know you use it, but what extent do you use it? And what are your thoughts on using it? Yeah. Well, I think it's necessary now. Um, it's becoming very prevalent, obviously, in college. But, I mean, I was just on Twitter the other day, and you watch all these guys pitching in spring training now, and there's cameras all set up behind them. Every single – almost every single camp or, or – organization MLB organization is is involved with it right for me the first thing that has to happen when a player comes to campus you you have to understand what their baseline what their fingerprints are of of their data right it's exactly what we're going to do even in a movement screening or um, in the weight room is we're going to get some baselines right now we're going to have an idea because we've watched this player pitch or play a few times before they get here to campus kind of what their needs are when they get here. But at the same time, we are going in the, in the fall session, we are going to allow them to pitch to kind of see, okay, what, what, you know, what adjustments do we need to make? And at what point do we need to make them? Right. And I'll give an example. So we had a freshman right-handed pitcher come in this year, this fall. And we knew that he was going to need to improve his breaking ball. Okay. Now, when he came here, he threw his pens leading up to scrimmages and we allowed him to throw his breaking ball from high school. And we allowed him to go through his process because at the some, sometimes getting in the way as a coach is, is worse than, than not. Right. Especially when you've got these guys coming in and you have to play ball immediately. You don't have a Correct. lot of time. We can't start. Correct. Screwing with shit, like, but right before yeah. you have to throw. Right. Correct. Right. Now we have, you know, our freshmen come in in summer B session and they'll work with our athletic tra um, trainer and strength coach to get them on par with the rest of the guys that come in during the fall. But we're going to throw six pens and then we're going to get ready to, to, um, to go into scrimmages. So getting back to the freshman, we knew that his slider needed to get better, right? We knew that because based off of his high school experience and his outings, we knew that it needed to get better. Right. So we got him here to campus and he's throwing his pens and we kind of allowed him to do his thing. And then once we got to scrimmages, we, we allowed him to go pitch in his first scrimmage. Mm -hmm. And then we allowed him to pitch in his second scrimmage. 
and throw his breaking ball from high school and everything. And at that point, after the second scrimmage, we as a collective staff said, you know what? It is time that we take a step back and we kind of go into back into a pen session and we break out some tech and we try to make, we break out some slow-mo video and we could actually make some um, in adjustments. coaching adjustments. Correct. Right. right. right? Um, Great. Because, yeah. In college, it's very difficult to, when you have eight or 10 pens on one day to just have every single pen be involved in technology right or right, try right. to make some sort of pitch manipulation during that pen so to here's the thing we use it we find a baseline and then when guys pitch in games i myself as as well as our player um, um director of player development we will go in every single time every single outing and i will look at all the baseball cloud information in the morning and i will look at things like extension rates i will look at breaks i will see hey is there something that is happening during the games that is not, not hap happening Great. during the pens right and it's very important from a pitching coach standpoint that you're on top of it because it could change in games, right? Without you noticing like, hey, this guy's extension rates on his breaking ball is becoming much shorter or his fastball is becoming much shorter. And why is this happening, right? So um, so it there is value there. I don't mean to get super long-winded on this. No, this. this is great. I'm actually writing this down because a lot of this to me deals with power endurance. You know, when you're in a pen and then when you actually have no breaks and you're in game, mm -hmm. um, if a guy's power endurance, if his ability to continue to throw without an elevated heart rate, um, mm -hmm. that'll allow his stuff, his extension to not change mm -hmm. over the course of a game. Whereas in pens, you might stop and talk and he's not continually throwing. Anyway, keep going. Yeah, so. no. So um, to what extent? I mean, we use it. It is it's there for us. We are um, fortunate that we have um, technology at the highest level here. Now, the thing as a coach, I think for me is when do you use it right when do you apply when is the right time to apply this or get this information to the player so we can give him some objective feedback so that way he looks at it and says oh okay i understand and and we can go to work in the bullpen so let me ask you a question then how do you how do you deal with a guy maybe who's not as quick of a learner and you start seeing morale issues in the pen with, with a guy who might be getting frustrated I'm asking you now for my pitching coaches here, our guys are throwing pens. Sometimes I can see the look on a guy's face when he's getting frustrated. And my staff meetings I try to deal with how to deal with morale issues. I'm just trying to pick your brain as somebody who's dealing with a consistent basis of elite athletes and how you deal with frustration in the yeah. pen. So shrinking the learning curve is something we as coaches are always trying to figure out, right? Like how do I get this player to where I want him to get to as quick as possible, right? Like that's the goal. So for me, if we are trying to, if if there's a plan that we have to um, in for this bullpen, for me, I will always bring the player in first and sit down and watch his video. And what I like to do is watch video based off when they've had success and when they've been really good. Okay. And then I will compare that to the video where they are now. Maybe the breaking ball isn't as sharp. Maybe the intent on the fastball is not there like it was last year, like it was in this specific scrimmage. So when we are going to the bullpen and we're trying to shrink the learning curve, you talked about being a slow learner. I want to show them what we are trying to achieve before we get to the pen, right? Before we go in the pen, I will base out a plan of like, do you see what was happening whatever day it was and what is happening currently now? And when we go out to the pen, this is where I want you to be. This is what we're shooting for. Right? That's great because that also gives the athlete some confidence that he was there at one point. Yeah. So this also gives him some confidence that, you know, listen, man, all we're really trying to do is get you where you were. Yeah, absolutely. I I don't want to misspeak. I would 
I was just watching this net the Netflix documentary, The Full Swing. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've seen it with the professional golfers. No, oh, it's amazing. You got to check it out. It's I just watched the first episode last night. It's called Full Swing, and it's a behind the scenes look at all the major PGA golfers. And each episode has one has you know different golfers. And the first episode is on Justin Thomas and Jordan Spieth, and right. they're best friends. And Justin Thomas's dad is his coach and when he is struggling he says oftentimes i just have to remind my son how good he is exactly how good you've been right that everybody goes through struggles but um you have to remind them sometimes like hey look what what success you have had in the past Right. right. So great. When shrinking learning curves, that's what I try to do. I try to, we try to bring the player in, show them on film where you were, where you are now, and what you want to achieve. Right. What do we want to achieve in our next pen? Does it necessarily mean that we're going to achieve it in that next pen? No. Right. But we're going to do the best we possibly can to shrink the learning curve, to get the player where we want him to get as soon as possible. There are no bad pens, right? We have a pen and if we can figure out what went wrong, that's a good pen. Absolutely. If you know that it didn't work, then you just push that out the window. Solve the problem. (laughs) On to the next. On to the next. Next one. Exactly. As far as program design goes, due to the fact that you have very limited time before competition begins, how much mechanical work and pitch design do you try to see if you can get from your guys in high sc- from high school? Do you go back and look for that, actively look for that, or do you just get, like you said, the in-game results? Or do you actually try to ask them if they've got some – because I know a lot of the college coaches, they'll call me and they'll say, hey, do you have any mocap on this guy? Do you have any Rhapsodo data on these guys? Do you ever go and look at places where they were training and try to actually – grab some stuff that you might be able to look at prior to them getting there due to the fact that you don't have that much time with them? So we have done that in the past, not to a great extent, Um, much more in-game video. We have the capability now with, with Synergy to go back and look at a lot of their high school outings, to look at a lot of their summer outings. Um, So we will get an idea um, based off of either our eyes because we've watched them ourselves um, or we can watch them in games on our videos so that when they get here, obviously, like I said, we have a we have a decent idea of where they are mechanically and what we're going to achieve with them once they get here. That's great. One more question on program design. When you're trying to design the blueprint for your guy and he gets here on day one, you were kind of talking about what you're looking at as far as the – their strength and as far as their mechanics can you give us an idea of what a baseline testing day athlete arrives upon arrival how do you integrate the strength and conditioning into the plan okay so that's that's multi-layered question um it's okay we still got 15 minutes yeah so um (laughs) all right so on the strength uh on our strength coach side he's gonna test for speed strength and power right speed strength and power speed 10 yard dash 30 yard 30 yard um, strength. We do trap bar, deadlift, split squat, power. We do jump testing, lateral um, jumps, broad jumps. Um, so in the strength side, we kind of hit those three buckets, right? right? On the athletic training side, our athletic trainer will run our players through a range of motion testing from, you know, ankles all the way up to, to um, through, throughout the body. Um we will do um, flexibility, mobility, range of motion, like I stated, um, uh, through our athletic uh, trainer who does that. We also have an orthopedic who runs who runs them through a through baseline testing as well. So that that's through our strength coach. That's through our athletic trainer, and then we will also do um, body comp testing. So we'll do body composition testing. We'll do uh, body weight, body fat, muscle mass. Um, So we're fortunate to have the resources in order to test this. And then basically, once we get these, this information back, we will kind of develop maybe like a short term and long term plan for some of these guys. And I, one guy, um, you know, our center fielder, for example, Mikey Robertson, 
he um he's extremely fast he's super twitchy guy um but he needs to develop more strength and he needs to develop more um more muscle mass right so we're gonna kind of push his nutrition towards gaining more pounds we're gonna push his uh, strength towards gaining more muscle gaining more pounds because we already know where he's really good right um so you asked like how do we apply it well first of all we have to get the information about where they're good and where they can get better and then we will apply it over time throughout their fall and throughout their spring in those buckets where they need to get better according lowest hanging fruit yeah 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 absolutely that is pretty much close to the exact assessment that we do on our guys when they come in here cool. We'll put them on the table. We'll do lean body mass testing, and then we'll put them yep. on the table for ranges of motion. And then we'll check their strength in the weight room. We'll check their speed with their running, and we'll check yeah. their power with jumps. We use VBT as well. I don't know if you use velocity-based training yeah. as far as creating those adaptations, but that's great, man. We're all kind of picking from the same. We we understand what helps players get better, and we understand that these buckets that, you know, whether it's speed, power, strength, mobility, we understand – we understand where the foundations are and we understand, okay, if a guy is strong in one, we need to get him better in the other. Right. And then right. by the time he leaves our program or by the time he leaves your program, maybe they're better in all of the aspects. That's true. But a lot of people do not know how to take the information and integrate it into yeah. their program. A lot of the stuff that you just talked about, you know, how a guy produces power that mm -hmm. can tell us a lot about how he loads his rear leg. You yeah. know what I mean? So there yeah. are things. And also if a guy needs to get strong, you want to get him strong, but you don't really want to, you don't want to sacrifice at the expense of make, of losing some of that twitchiness that he has. Yeah. So there is an Absolutely. art to doing that. There's a yes. way to do that. Yeah. You Absolutely. Know? And it takes time, right? Like an experience. You also, you also don't want to trade off and get a guy super strong, but you get him hurt. Right. Yeah. Cause you're trying to do too much or he and, gets slow. Yeah. Or, or he get, goes in the other direction. He gets slow. But the, the one thing too is, all of this stuff happens over time. When I could use myself, for example, like when I went into college, I weighed 180 pounds, right? And when I left college, I was close to 215, right? Maybe because I had some pizzas and, and, right. and you know, but, yeah. but, but my maturation, my maturity process through the three years of actually being on a nutrition plan and going to the weight room five, six times a day and getting on a conditioning plan and understanding my body as I got older from 18 to 21, like it took time. Right. And, and I really didn't throw my hardest pitch actually until I was 26 years old. So I was still getting stronger. I was still on my body. I was, and you know, I think it's tough someday, some nowadays we try to chase it so early. Right. We right. chase this so early and, and you have to understand that, you know, that it takes time. There's a, there's a, it was somebody once said the popcorn in the, in the bag, they, they pop at different times. Right. Yeah. And early to ripe, early to rot too. Yeah. So you got to be careful about these guys that are getting too developed too young. And then they yeah. bust. It's hard to escape because it's happening. You, you just go on social media and you see one guy is super young, 15 years old, and he's throwing this. And then the next person tries to chase it. Right. right. And everything is right. so specialized and it's, it's tough to escape. It's very tough. I got a question for you. What, what are some differences you generally see with pitchers coming from the Northeast yeah. compared to the South and West, the warmer climates where they're kind of playing more ball? Um, it's a good question. So we haven't had too, too many currently at the university of Florida, too, too many guys from the Northeast. Um, we've had a few. And by the time they get here out of high school, they're pretty developed and, pretty mature. I mean, based off my history that a lot of guys down here in South Florida play more baseball outside than those in the Northeast because of the weather. And sometimes that could be a good thing. Sometimes that could be a bad thing because playing more baseball, depending on if you're just showcasing yourself and playing ball, playing ball, you're not learning the game. Whereas in some guys in the Northeast that may be playing other sports right? Like basketball, football, or golf, or whatever it is. You know, I say golf, like it's outside. But developing movement patterns. Correct. Yeah, developing different kind of movement patterns that are helping and hurt. You know, like I said, it, you just don't know which direction it could could go in. So I've seen both. I've seen 
guys from the Northeast be a little bit behind in their development of playing of, of playing baseball and being outside. But I've also seen it where the other spectrum where guys are doing other sports. And then by the time they get in college, they end up passing the other person right right along because this the whoever was playing X amount of games in in Florida. Right. right? So I've right. kind of seen a little bit of both. Awesome. Last question. We can't have a complete conversation here without talking about the transfer portal. Your thoughts, does this make it harder for high school kids to get picked up? And uh, I, I think it was Nate Yeski I was talking to. He was saying that for him that a lot of times people think it's just a, just a no-brainer to get a college kid because you can get a college kid with more experience at this point. Mm -hmm. But at that point, you also might get a guy who's a little bit more set in his ways that's not ready to roll with your program. Mm -hmm. And um, whereas you can get a really good high school kid who's hungry and ready to play ball for you. You yeah. know what I mean? So what are your thoughts on, on, the, on the portal? Yeah. So last summer – I think there was 2,500 players, division one players in the transfer portal, right? So I do believe because there are more players out there that it is tougher for the high school player to fit in, right? Because majority of programs will at times tend to go for the player that has that experience at the division one level than to try to get a guy as a freshman and throw him in the fire and he might not be ready. Right. Right. I think, um, how do I say this? Like here in our program, we have, since I've been here, we have majority went for the high school player because those guys are going to develop within your program. And we filled some needs along the way. We were able to grab an older catcher from, um, from the transfer portal two years ago who brought some experience and leadership in the catching position because we were lacking it at this, at that time. So that kind of helped a need at the moment. We have not filled our roster with um, transfer portal guys. And I, you know, maybe it might work for other programs, but just in my experience, I think that developing the high school player, um, you know, is, is beneficial because they are growing with your culture, right? Whereas in somebody comes from another program. That's what I'm saying. Program. Yeah. Yep. And, and they may ha already have been in another, uh, another culture, um, you know, and grown up for, as a freshman, but, you know, I, my, there are times I, my heart does hurt for some high school players because I think they're going to get looked you know, or push to the side, I guess you would say, because there are a whole bunch of players that are now available for programs to go grab. Um, and it's not going anywhere, right? This is happening every single year. There's going to be more players and it, it works on both sides of the spectrum. It's not just coaches going to get the players. There are players that may not be happy where they are and are seeking other opportunities. So it's a, it's a two-way street. Um, and, uh, but it, the NCAA has allowed for players to get, make a decision to go to other places and not sit out. And when I played, you know, when I was in school, I had to sit out a year. So it made you stay in the program and kind of like work it through. Right. Um, you know, so, but to get back to answer your question, I, I do think that it's, it's going to make it tougher for the high school player, um, with other with the transfer portal and other players out there they're competing against a whole nother uh bucket right yeah they're competing. it's not just they're competing against high school players or junior college players anymore yeah, for the spot they're, they're, yeah. they're, they're yeah they're competing against an extra however many pitchers or hitters it's uh, actually it's a little bit more like real life yeah uh, oh yeah you know, but yeah. uh we've been talking to coach david cop pitching coach with powerhouse university of florida uh, Dave, thanks for being with us today, man. This was really, really, uh, this was educational for me as well. So, well, well I appreciate it. No, thank you. Thank this you. Was, this, this was really, how can guy, how can people reach out to you? How can they find you on, on Instagram or Twitter or anything? Yeah. Um, I really don't do too much social media, although I am on Twitter, the information okay. highway, right? Okay. Information highway. Right. Uh, my Twitter handle, it's just my name, David. K O P P and then underscore um, very simple. Sh um, you know, they could reach out to me there, shoot me a DM. I, I can't, 
there are NCA rules as far as responding yep. back. So yep. if I don't, if I don't answer, if I don't answer there, there might be a NCA rule I have to follow, but that's the easiest way to do it. Awesome. And you guys can reach out to me at, at Nunzio Signore on Twitter, uh, my facility, RPP Rockland peak performance at RPP underscore baseball on Instagram and Twitter website is rocklandpeakperformance.com. Um, if you haven't checked out my book on velocity-based training, how to apply science, technology, and data to maximize performance, uh, you can get that through uh, Human Kinetics, or you can get it on Amazon. Um, once again, thanks to David Kopp today for talking all things pitching, and um, we'll see you next time on the Behind the Seams podcast. Thanks, Dave, for being here, man. Thank you.